Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be a continuation of the symbolism in the Bible, horns. Get your King James Bible. Go to Daniel chapter 8. And we're going to take a look at it. Horns in the Bible, for a recap, for since I'm not doing daily Bible studies, but horns in the Bible has reference to power. I mean, what is the power of a rhinoceros? It's in his horn, right? Or uh, a bull. You know, a thousand pound male cow, right? Cattle. They got horns. That's their uh, strength. I mean, even, even lions are careful of that, right? So, horns is a figure of speech symbolism. So, with that in mind, let's go to Daniel chapter 8. And if you were to ask me my opinion of the hardest book of the Bible to understand, my, my guess would be Daniel. So, verse 1. In the third year of the king, in the third year of the reign of the king Belshazzar, Okay, B-E-L is the name of a satanic god. So, King Nebuchadnezzar, his father, the ruler of Babylon, gave his son a name that honors his god. And I find it interesting that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar wrote the fourth chapter of Daniel under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So I guess he was a, became a believer. And let's face it, God raises kings up and God brings them down. He brings them up and he brings them down. A lot of people don't realize that. When people have a wicked ruler, it's because the heart of the people generally as a rule, is wicked. God will send you the rulers that we deserve. Read the book of Judges. When Israel did evil, God sent evil rulers over them. And nothing's changed. Why is the New World Order coming? Because God's people are evil, for the most part. So, so, like I mentioned, if you see B-E-L or uh, B-A-A-L, like Jezebel, I mentioned that in the last video, um, Jezebel had in her name the name of the false god. So, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. Now, a little bit of background here. Remember, Israel was divided into two kingdoms. Southern kingdom of Judah, which was, the capital was Jerusalem. And then the northern capital of Israel, which was ten tribes, whose headquarters capital was Samaria and Judah was Judah portion of Benjamin and the Levites so but northern Israel was taken into captivity by the Assyrians and then Judah years later was taken captive by the Babylonians, who 
basically took over the whole area, including Syria and Assyria. Verse 2. And I saw in a vision that came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Uli. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, a ram which had two horns, two horns. There was a reason for the two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. Now this is talking about a kingdom. And I saw the ram pushing westward, and northward, and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will, and became great. Verse 5. And as I was considering, behold, excuse me, an he goat, an he goat, uh, just a quick mention here. What is a symbol of the Church of Satan? A goat? Didn't uh, the Rolling Stones that did uh, their album? Uh, for his satanic majesty's request. Didn't they have a or an album or a song or an album called Goat's, Goat's Head Soup? Oh yeah. In the book of Exodus, when they were in the wilderness of sin, they took a goat and released it in the wilderness as a symbol of taking away Israel's sin. I don't know, if you've never read the book of Exodus, you would never know this, but, you know, it's symbolic, right? But uh, a goat is the symbol of Satanism. Is that a coincidence or an accident? I don't know, but it's something to consider. All right, and as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with Kohler against him. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Kohler? All right, Webster's 1828 Dictionary. And by the way, Webster was a language scholar, a linguist, and he was a believer, a Bible believer. And when you look up words that are in the Bible, he'll actually give you the biblical reference of where that word is located in the Bible. Kohler means anger or wrath. So let's go back to read that again. Um, let's see. Yeah, verse 7. Daniel 8, 7. And I saw him come close unto the ram, the he-goat, and he was moved with choler against him and smote the ram and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, 
but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Hmm. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So here it is, this great horn, the single great horn was broken, but yet four littler ones, notable ones, came up in its stead. Now this was written before it even happened. And I'm going to go into this, but, you know. Verse 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And I'm guessing the pleasant land would be the land of Israel. But I, I'm not 100% sure. Please don't quote me. Verse 10. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. I'm going to have to stop right here. We're going to have to take a look at this. Well, what is the Lord of hosts? Uh, well, we'll take a look at Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 3. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, What is the host of heaven? That is God's mighty army, his angels, the good angels. He says, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. So, the host of heaven is his angelic army. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 12. And uh, we'll take a look at the war in heaven. Now, I believe my guess is the war in heaven happened sometimes, sometime in the days of Adam. Sometime between the time that Adam was created until the time that they partook of the tree of good and evil. That's when my belief is when this war occurred. But there could have been more than one. I, I don't know. That's my guess. And I'm, no, I'm not saying it happened. I'm just saying it could have. All right, Revelation 12, verse 7. And there was, past tense, right? Some people will say, oh, this is the future because it's in Revelation. Eh, I don't think so. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. The dragon and his angels prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, remember that serpent in the Garden of Eden? Oh uh, yeah. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, God has a host army, and the devil and Satan has a host army. Now, let's read Daniel 8.10. Speaking of the he-goat, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven, 
And it cast down some of the host, the angelic army, and of the stars to the ground and stomped upon them. Now, are these burning stars? Because if stars were burning to the ground, how, uh, you know, you're not going to take a star from the sky and bring it to the earth and then stomp on it. Your feet are going to get burned, right? Oh, yeah. It's a figure of speech. All right. So, uh, hmm. Where's these stars at? Well, take a look at Job 38. All right, book of Job. Uh, chapter 38. Verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge in other in modern english that would be uh who's this one talking without uh, doesn't know what they're talking about you know you're speaking but you don't know what you're talking about verse three gird up now thy loins like a man in other words put on your pants like a man for i will demand of thee and answer thou me in other words i'm going to ask you a question and i want you to give me an answer Verse 4, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Yeah, when I created heaven and earth, where were you? You weren't even born yet, buddy boy. Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Now, these are construction type terms, terms. You know, measuring and stretching a line. You know, when you're when you're building a wall, you take a piece of string and you stretch it tight. And then you use that string as a guide to make the wall so that it's as straight as possible. You don't want a crooked wall, right? Verse 6. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Uh, where's the foundation of the earth? Is it nailed to a board? No. Or who hath laid the cornerstone thereof? Well, Christ is the cornerstone, spiritually speaking. But um, if you're building a house, if you lay the cornerstone wrong, the house is not going to be square. You know, you're not, it's, it's going to be off. So the cornerstone being laid was very, very important. You know, it, it, it was either the house being built right or the house being built wrong. And Christ is the cornerstone of our faith. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner, the cornerstone. That's a whole study in and, in and of itself. And I've covered some of that stuff. So. so God's asking Job, where were you when I created the earth? Verse 7. When the morning stars sang together. Hmm. Morning stars? Take a look at Isaiah 14. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. It's talking about the foundation of the earth. But the morning stars singing together, and all the sons of God shouting, shouted for joy. Now, in the six days of creation, on what day were the angels created? The Bible doesn't say. When was Adam created? On the sixth day. The earth was created. Adam was created after. 
So at the foundation of the earth, when the earth was first created, Adam was not around to shout for joy. But the morning stars, the sons of God, were around to shout for joy. Now since the Bible doesn't tell you when God created the angels, but when you read the morning stars and the sons of God, these can't be Adam or his descendants. They can't be because the earth came before Adam did. Adam can't be shouting for joy before he was created, can he? Oh, that only works if you're in a Baptist church. Oh, and for those of you who think I'm picking on the Baptists, well, I got an earned master's degree from a Baptist college, Bible college. I call it cemetery. I mean, Bible cemetery. I mean, Bible seminary. Maybe I was right the first time, cemetery. But uh, you ask almost all of them, who are the sons of God in Genesis 6 when they went into the women and had giants for children? And they'll tell you, oh, well, those were the godly, those were the godly men of Seth. And the daughters of men, well, those are the children, those are the daughters of Cain. So godly men marry ungodly women and they have giants for children? Really? Huh. Yeah. That's the kind of garbage that you'll learn in a Baptist church. Really. Now, the sons of God were angels. After all, who was their father? Christians do not become sons of God until we are adopted into the, the family by uh, the Holy Spirit. We do not become sons of God until salvation occurs. Besides, the morning stars and the sons of God shout for joy at the foundation or the creation of the earth. Adam didn't exist until six days later. So, bingo. The giants of old were from fallen angels mating with women. Now, I got an entire playlist on that for as long as it stays up on you know who tube um <laughs> yeah but i'm also i also have a channel on odyssey now i've given up on gab i've given up on world truth uh bit shoot was okay for a while but they started muting the audio on my videos they wouldn't play and then i found out that bit shoot joined the United Nations Initiative for tech, tech Companies Against Terrorism. Whatever that means. But they, they, joined, they joined the United Nations to do censorship of those that they consider terrorism and hate. Yeah. So, I'm on tube, I'm on Odyssey, and that's about it. So, let's go back to Daniel 8. Verse 10, and it, the he goat, and it waxed great, even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Figures of speech. Now, I don't know how this he goat, which we're going to find out who this he goat is soon, how he cast down some of the host of heaven, the angels, and of the stars to the ground, the angels, and stamped upon them. You know, that's, I'm not exactly sure how that occurred. 11. Yea, he magnified, magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the palace. I'm sorry, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So this he goat actually caused the daily sacrifice to cease. Verse 12. 
and an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Hmm. So, the sacrifice was stopped, and it cast down truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Evil practiced and prospered. Verse 13. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That's about 6.3 years, if days are days. All right, let's go to verse 15. And oh, by the way, did you catch that? Um, when the Bible talks about a dragon or a serpent, it's talking about the devil and Satan, just like we read in Revelation chapter 12. You know, the Bible is full of symbolism. So when people say, oh, well, the Bible's all symbolic. Well, it's not all symbolic. Or if people say, well, I take the Bible literally. Um, you really think Satan is a snake that slithers around in the grass? I don't think so. No. No, it's both literal and symbolic. And knowing which is which makes a difference. So, all right. So, uh, 2,300 days, the sanctuary will be cleansed. Verse 15, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Who's Gabriel? Uh, ooh, that's a good question. Gabriel was who appeared to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, and told him that uh, he was going to have a son. Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her she would have a son. And she told him to call his name Yeshua HaMashiach. No, he was told to call him Jesus. So when you hear somebody say the Yeshua thing, basically what they're doing is denying the New Testament. Yeah. Uh, that is what they are doing, believe it or not. And oh, by the way, when you see E-L in a name, like Gabriel or Mike L, Michael, E-L, it has reference to the Lord as, you know, like servant, a servant of the Lord kind of thing. Daniel, you know, so, uh, let's see. All right, we're going to take a look at something here. All right, in Luke chapter 1, Let's see, verse 26, Luke 1, 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, very important, the virgin birth. That's a very important thing. 
to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Here it is, an angel went to Mary, Gabriel. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. She's thinking, what in the world is going on? Or what in heaven is going on, right? And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Hmm. Now this is Gabriel, the angel sent from the Lord. In verse 31, and he says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus, not Yeshua. See, the Yeshua crowd is telling you your Bible's wrong. They're right, but your Bible's wrong. That's what they're telling you. When you hear people use Yeshua, they're telling you the New Testament is wrong and that they know more than the scholars that worked on the King James Bible. They're actually denying Jesus. When I hear Yeshua, I, I know I'm listening to a Christ denier. Gabriel, who was sent of the Lord, said, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So who are we going to believe? Are we going to believe Gabriel and the Bible? Or are we going to believe Hebrew root heretics and Yeshua? Now in Luke 1 and verse 19, Gabriel went in to see Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. And you can read, well, you can read the whole ch first chapter of Luke. Gabriel appears twice. Once to Zechariah and once to Mary. So who are we going to believe? Daniel 8, 9, uh, 8, 16. Daniel 8, 16. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and, and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he, Gabriel, came near where I stood, and he came. I was afraid and fell upon my face. Boy, I think I'd be afraid too, man. An angel of the Lord come. Oof. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. What is indignation? Indignation is extreme hatred. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. The ram, which thou sawest having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. 
Ah, the ram with the two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. They were allies, probably similar people. What is Persia today? Where is Persia today? Well, today Persia calls themselves Iran, Iranians. Yeah. In New Testament times, uh, Persia was called Parthia. Do you know that the Parthians were mentioned in the book of Acts? Because they came to Jerusalem to hear the gospel. Oh, yeah. You could read about Parthia. P-A-R-T-H-I-A. -I, I believe it's how it's spelled. Parthia. Parthia existed during the time of the Roman Empire. Rome and Parthia were rivals and enemies. Rome tried to conquer Parthia and they got their butts whipped uh, a few times. You know, they won a few battles, but they did not win the war. Yeah. And honestly, I believe Parthia had some Israelites in it. But, uh, you know, it's interesting. Look up Parthia. Pause this study right now and look up Parthia. And you can read all about Rome. You can read all about Roman history, but Parthia is like hardly even exists. I didn't even learn about Parthia until like a, a year or two or three ago. Here it is. I went to college for two years. Uh, I mean, I mean a, a state college, not, not the Bible college. Took world history and American history. I never even learned Parthia. What is, what is a Parthia? I used to read the, the, the book of Acts about the Parthians uh, being there on the day of Pentecost. And do you even know that the, the, the word Pentecost is Greek? Yeah, it's not a Hebrew word. So, why is Media and Persia important? The ram with the two horns. They were the ones that conquered Babylon at the end of 70 years. Remember I told you that uh, Judah was taken into captivity for 70 years into Babylon? Well, at the end of the 70 years, when King Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, uh, was drinking wine out of the, the cups of the God's temple and mocking the Lord, he sent the Medes and the Persians. And then they conquered Babylon. Matter of fact, uh, from what I understand, there was a, uh, if, mem if I remember correctly, there was a river that flowed by there or right next to the city or whatever the city was next to it. I don't remember exactly how. But from what I understand, they, um, they dammed up the river and it didn't flow for like three days and all that water you know created a, a dam wall of water and it just burst through and a big flood of water just smashed into the walls of Babylon and created a hole and then the Medes and the Persians flooded through the hole and killed uh, King Belshazzar Nebuchadnezzar's son and that's in, that is actually in the book of Daniel about how they, uh, uh, King Belshazzar was deposed, killed, and how the Medes and the Persians took over and allowed Judah to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And you can read about that in the book of Ezra, and you can read about that in the book of Nehemiah. You know, it's amazing to me anyways. I mean, this, this kind of stuff, 
it, just reading the Bible by in and of itself is good, but knowing the history behind it is, I think, even better. So, but yeah, the Persians, uh, they treated Judah quite well. And they gave them everything they needed for the rebuild. And they gave them food and they gave them animals and livestock to do the sacrifices. Allowed them to take all the gold and uh, vessels, gold, the golden vessels and what have you, the furniture, the temple. And take it back and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Yeah. Uh, perhaps you've heard of Darius, or I've heard it pronounced Darius, and I've heard it called Darius, or Cyrus. They're actually mentioned in the Bible. Of course, I was reading some history books, and they're saying, oh, they didn't exist in history. They only exist in the Bible. You know, but you got to realize the Antichrist, plural, uh, control the publishing houses now. They've totally rewritten history. That's why you don't know anything about Parthia. Parthia doesn't exist. Matter of fact, I think Parthia was a large number of Israelites. I really do, but I can't prove it. All right, so let's go to Daniel 8 and verse 21. You know, the thing is, when a... When God's people are wicked, God will send wicked rulers over them. All right, so let's go to Daniel 8 and verse 21. And the rough goat, the he goat, that we read about earlier, remember, with the one horn? And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, Greece. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Greece. Hmm. Did you ever see the movie? What is it? The uh, the three hundred. The Battle of Therm Thermopylae, where the Spartan soldiers held off the Persian army. Well. Persia did some serious damage to Greece. Didn't totally conquer it, but uh, the uh, Athenians, where Paul went, by the way, to preach the gospel, the Athenians were had a navy, and they their uh, ships were very maneuverable. And they had a, uh, I think it was called a trireme. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. But, but it had a battering ram below the water surface. And they would row the ship into other, the enemy ships in the middle and poke a hole in it. And, uh, you know, when you got a hole in your ship, you know, the whole ship sinks. Yeah. So... The Athenians were a naval power. But you got to realize, during this time period, Greece was not a unified country. They spoke a common language, but they were like city-states. And they didn't always cooperate with each other. But the Athenians had the Persian navy, which was huge compared to the Athenians huge and they had them bottled up in this tight little area and they were able to defeat the persian navy now the athenians um they uh, didn't so much have an army but but a navy they were pretty good sparta the spartans perhaps you've heard of um uh, how, you know, if you've ever heard, oh, he lives a Spartan lifestyle, means they, they, didn't, they didn't live with very much. Just what was absolutely necessary. They were trained up to be warriors from their youth. 
And they held off the Persian army for like three days in this narrow pass. So even though the Persian army was huge, they could not use that for their advantage until, of course, they found a way to attack them from the front and the rear. And then that was the end. That was the end. But it gave, it gave the, um, the rest of Greece three days to get prepared. So it's, you know, <laughs> right out of history, right in the Bible. There you go. So in verse 21, so Persia attacked Greece and conquered parts of it. But in verse 21, and the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Um, I believe uh, there was a King Philip of Macedonia. And if you listen to the Jesuits, they'll tell you that uh, Macedonia and Greece are different. But when you look at them, you can't tell the difference. And they both speak the Greek language. And as far as I'm concerned, Macedonia is Greek. And here in the Bible, it tells you King of Grecia. Well, Philip had a son called Alexander. History calls him Alexander the Great. Uh, was it because of his character? I don't think so, but rather because of his conquests. I believe the Lord's hand was upon him to carry out his will. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. That was Alexander. When you look at the map, he conquered Egypt, Israel, Syria, Babylon, Greece, part of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and a sliver of India. He basically conquered the entire known world at the time. He was one of the greatest empires that ever existed. Think about it. Verse 22. Now that being broken. Now, I don't know how true it is, but from what I understand, Alexander fancied himself to be a god. And he died at a very young age. I think he was 30 or 32, something like that. And some suspect that he was possibly poisoned. I don't know. I mean, here it is. His men marched around for, I forget how long, but, you know, can you imagine marching for, conquering for three or so years? You conquer the whole area, the whole known world. You want to go back and see your, your family. You know, you left your wife. She was pregnant. Now you got a kid that's probably two, three years old. You've never even seen him. Well, his men were getting tired of conquering the whole world. And they wanted to go home and enjoy the fruits of their labors. But he didn't want to, he didn't want to hear it. So did somebody poison him? I don't know. Perhaps one day we'll find out. But he was pretty young. He was in the prime of life, pretty much, when he died. Did he lift himself up and God snuffed out his life? Perhaps. But verse 22 explains what happened. Now that being broken, the great horn, whereas four stood up for it. So out of the one horn came four horns. Four kingdoms shall stand, stand up out of a nation, but not in his power. Well, guess what happened? When Alexander died, his four generals, his four top generals, said, hey, look, guys, are we going to fight each other to see who runs the kingdom, or are we going to divide it up? And that's what happened. They divided they divided up the territory between the four of them. Now remember, 
Egypt was conquered by Alexander. Have you ever heard of Alexandria, Egypt? Alexandria, Egypt supposedly had the greatest library in the world. And of course, the Romans burned it when they conquered uh, around the time all this was happening was about 300 years before Christ. That's the time period when all this kind of stuff is going on. But Alexander conquered Egypt. Egypt was very important in the Middle East because of the Nile River, uh, fresh water, and uh, Egyptian cotton is very, very famous and very expensive. It's very good quality. So is Egyptian wheat. Egypt was always the breadbasket of the Middle East. That's why Alexander wanted it. That's why Rome conquered Egypt. Oh, yeah. Egypt was very important. But Alexandria, Egypt, was that city was named in the honor of Alexander. And one of the generals became king and ruler of Egypt. Have you ever heard of Cleopatra? Her beauty was legendary. She was the offspring of the Greek ruler, the Greek, one of the Greek generals who took over Egypt. Uh, I, I, let, me, let me look that up. All right, in, uh, according to Wikipedia, Wikipedia, Ptolemy, P-T-O-L-E-M-Y, was a Macedonian, a Greek, who was one of Alexander's most trusted generals and confidants, won control of Egypt from his rivals, and declared himself Pharaoh. Uh, he was in, he ruled Egypt from 305 B.C. or 304 B.C. to his death. Uh, and that dynasty ruled Egypt until the death of Cleopatra. Mm. I bet you Cleopatra was probably a blonde, blonde-haired, blue-eyed beauty. Yeah. And they want you to think that she was uh, an Egyptian. Did they teach you this in world history in college? No. No. All right, so four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. Now, one of the things should mention is Alexander's generals, uh, there were four of them with the four areas, you know, they fought wars against each other. I, I I don't remember the exact, what exactly happened. But I know that uh, one general uh, attacked another general. And by doing this, they weakened each other. And then about uh, after the death of Cleopatra, Rome came. When did Rome conquer Egypt and Israel? All right, check this out. Rome's rule over Egypt officially began with the arrival of Octavian, uh, who they uh, later called Augustus. You ever heard of the month of August? It was named in honor of Octavian in 30 BC. So 30 years before Christ was born, Rome conquered Egypt. That means for about 300 years, approximately, Greece ruled Egypt. Uh, this happened following the defeat of Mark Anthony and Cleopatra in the Battle of Actium. Wow. So when did... Uh, When did Rome? And then in 63 BC, the Roman general Pompey captured Jerusalem. 
Oh, okay. So, here it is. You had the Greeks ruling this area for 300, about 300 years. About. Give or take a couple of decades, right? Uh, when you get conquered by a people, what is the common language that, you know, are, are you going to tell... Uh, are you going to tell the, the king, oh, will you, uh, I speak English, so you're going to have to learn English, buddy boy. No. You're going to learn Greek, peasant. Greek was the common language, not only in Greece, but in that whole area. In the Middle East, if you wanted to con conduct commerce, business, you knew Greek. For 300 years, they knew the Greeks ruled. And you're going to learn the language of the conquerors. <laughs> you better believe it. You go to L.A. or you go to Miami, Florida, guess what? Spanish. We've been conquered, people. We've been conquered. Now, remember when we were, we read earlier in verse, let's see, what was it? Uh, verse 13, it talks about the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation. Uh, now, remember, Greek, um, Persia allowed Judah to return and build the temple and do sa animal sacrifices. But when the Greeks came, they stopped the daily sacrifice. They stopped it. And if you read the book of Maccabees, which is part of the Apocrypha, or if you read about Josephus, the uh, Judah revolted against the Greeks and what have you. You know, you could read about it. There's a lot of differing, differing opinions. That's why I don't want to get too much into it. But the, uh, the Greeks um, desecrated the temple. Yeah. So let's... Uh, all right, so verse 23 of Daniel chapter 8. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Uh, I believe this is the, lat when they say latter time, I think this is talking about the end times. It'll have attributes similar to, to Greece, and Rome, I'm sure. But I think this is going to be the end time kingdom. And I'm going to try to tie this up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice. And he shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Ooh, let's stop right there. And we're going to go to the book of Revelation. All right, let's read that again in Daniel 8. So there's going to be a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. All righty. So let's take a look how this ties in with Revelation. All right, we're going to read Revelation 13 and then we're going to read Revelation 17. And I think these tie right into Daniel. But uh, yeah, what do I know? Revelation 13, lucky 13, right? If you're a gambler, yeah, right. Verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast, a 
beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. There's those horns again. And upon his horns, ten crowns. Oh yeah, horns are power and they got crowns. They're like a king, right? And upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Mouth of a lion. A mouth speaking things like the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? But he's not the lion of the tribe of Judah. And the dragon, remember we read in Revelation 12, the dragon, the serpent was called the devil and Satan. So the dragon gave him the beast and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. See, this beast, like in Daniel uh, 24, and it says, And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. His power is going to come from, the beast's power is going to come from the dragon, which is the Satan and devil. Verse uh, Revelation 13, 2. And the dragon gave him his power and a seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Well, if you're just a mere human, it ain't going to be you, buddy boy, girly girl. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That's about three and a half years, people. This is going to be during the Great Tribulation. This is going to be hell on earth. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. But uh, all the people over in the Middle East, oh, he's going to be their Messiah. And he opens his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war, war, W-A-R, war with the saints. And to overcome them and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Uh, let's read Daniel 8, 24 again. And his power shall be mighty. The beast, right? But not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper in practice and shall destroy and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Hmm. Daniel 13, 7. And it was given unto him, the beast, to make war with the saints, the holy people, right? And to overcome them. And power was given over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Were our names written in the book of life from the foundation of the world? I strongly believe that. Verse 9. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. So if the Lord wills you to go into captivity, to be martyred, to give your life, as a testimony for Christ, that's what the Lord wants you to do. Do it. And he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Now, if they want to kill you because of your skin color, 
by all means, protect your family. But if they want to kill you because of your testimony and your faith in Christ, and you fight them, if you kill them with a gun, you'll die by a gun. Live by the sword, die by the sword. I'm not saying you should let somebody break into your house and rape and murder your 12-year-old daughter. Sorry, that ain't what I'm saying. Send them to meet their father, the devil. 12 gauges are real good about that. But if they come to take you for your faith in Christ, we're supposed to go willingly. Read Matthew 24. We'll be brought before councils and in the synagogues. And we'll be questioned and tortured and murdered. It's going to happen, people. Maybe not all of us, but some of us. He that killeth the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. There are those horns again. And who was the lamb of God? Christ. He was a sacrificial lamb, right? But this beast had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So he pretends like he's a lamb, but he's a beast, and he speaks like the devil. I mean, a dragon. Well, the dragon is the devil and Satan. Verse 12. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, miracles, people, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. You can read about this in the book of Job. I think it's in the first or second chapter of Job. Uh, fire came down from heaven and devoured some of Job's, uh, either his livestock or his workers. I'm not sure. I don't remember. But one of the one of the people came to Job and said, the fire of the Lord came down and devoured. Yeah. So this guy is going to be doing false miracles. Well, satanic miracles, I should say. I mean, when you bring fire down from heaven, you know, a guy's in a tank and fire comes down and burns up the tank. How do you, how do you fight that? You don't. You don't. And Elijah, when you read the book of Kings, First and Second Kings, Chronicles, Elijah the prophet did the same thing. He brought fire down from heaven. And I truly believe that the false prophet is going to be do, able to do this and he's going to claim to be Elijah the prophet bringing in the, uh, heralding in the true Messiah. Well, their true Messiah. That's what he's going to tell everybody. He's going to pretend to be Elijah because it says in the book of, ooh, I forget. Could be Micah, I'm not sure. Could be Zechariah. Uh, that he'll send Elijah the prophet before that great and notable day of the Lord. Or a dreadful day of the Lord. I forget. I'm paraphrasing. Oh, I guess I need to look it up, don't I? Remember I told you that E-L has reference to God? E-L-I-J-A-H. Elijah. Yeah. Even his name has reference to the Lord. I'm sorry, I was wrong. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. There we go. And Jesus likened John the Baptist to Elijah. Uh, the Bible says that John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. But John was not Elijah. He even he was asked if he was Elijah, and he said no. And I think John knew who he was. And besides, 
Gabriel told Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, to call him, thou shalt call his name John. You know, the only way you can get John to be Elijah is if you believe in reincarnation. And by the way, Elijah never died. He was taken up into heaven. Elijah is going to be one of the two witnesses that confronts the beast. And I've done a study on all this. I did an hour, 40 minute study on the life of Elijah. Uh, it's well worth your time. Believe me, it is. Verse 13, Revelation 13, 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, the false prophet. 14, And deceiveth, deceiveth, deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those satanic miracles, oh, by means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. Ah, there we go. Satanic miracles, people. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Here's where the wilderness experience comes in, people. You're either going to worship the uh, image of the beast take the mark or you'll be martyred or you'll go into the wilderness to flee from the image of the beast flee from the beast that's why it's good to know first aid skills that's why it's good to know what's what to eat in the wilderness that's why it's good to know how to build a fire and you know, these things are going to come in handy for some of us, maybe. I don't know. The remnant. You know, when when all the rabbis proclaim that this guy is the Messiah, and everybody on TBN, like Benny Hinn probably, and the rest of that crew, almost everybody's going to believe it. Billy Graham's son, what's his name, Franklin? Oh, the Messiah has come. Worship him. And cause that as many as would not worship the image of thee should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. What day was Adam created? Day number six. Oh, yeah. And his number is 603 score and six. 666. 666. And people ask me, Bob, what do you think's the uh, mark of the beast? I think it's a chip. I really do. Um, short story. When I first came to the Lord in 1989, I was reading the Bible from cover to cover, finished it in 1990 for the first time, reading the Bible from cover to cover. I just read this and asked the Lord in prayer, Lord, what is the mark of the beast? That next morning, I opened up the newspaper and there was a Jewish veterinarian in chip, uh, implanting a microchip into an, uh, a pet, a dog, for identification. I mean, if you lose your dog, if your dog, you know, uh, let's say it was 4th of July and fireworks going off and the dog was scared and ran off, dug under the fence and ran off, and then animal control finds your dog, they scan the chip, boop, oh, okay, this is... Uh, Sally Smith's dog, and she lives at 123 Main Street, any town USA. So they, you know, give you a call and say, hey, we got your dog. Come, come pick her up or pick him up, whatever. And at the time, I was, you know, I had studied electronics. I was in studying computer science. And I thought, wow, that makes sense. You know? 
with the advent of modern computers and chips, guess what? Your, uh, your real ID driver's license, it's got a chip. Your passport, chip. Your uh, ATM card, your bank card, your credit card, your debit card, chips. Suppose they took these chips, made it all one and all, government ID and, and banking info, and put it in a chip and implanted it in your right hand. And matter of fact, there's, it's been done already. Hey, maybe that's what all this cryptocurrency is all about. Digital currency, they're working on that now. People, it fits like a glove, custom-made glove. Now, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying I'm a prophet. But I think, I do believe, it could have been a coincidence, but I do believe that's what the Lord showed me. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. You know? And uh, got those guys that are married, we don't need to remember our mistakes because that's what it, that's why we got a wife to remind us of our mistakes. So, yeah, they got to keep us in line, right? Hopefully, you got a godly wife that keeps you in line. Some of us do, and some of us don't. So, all right. Um, Let's go to Revelation 17. All right, let's read let's read Daniel 8 23 and 24 again real quick. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Mm. All right, Revelation 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto me, unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Remember the beast rises up out of the sea? Verse 2, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, spiritual fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple. Purple is royalty, people. That's the color of royalty. And scarlet color. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Stop right here. Everybody will point, well, your demon nominational preachers and the so-called Protestants We'll point at this and say, that is Rome. Purple, scarlet, gold, precious stones, pearls. That's Rome. But you should know something. These are all the colors of the that the Lord told the Levitical priesthood to have in the book of Leviticus. The priests. And yeah, I know the Roman Catholic Church calls their clergy priests having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication and upon her forehead was a name written mystery Babylon the great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And everybody's going to point and say, oh, that's the Vatican. She killed the martyrs and she killed the saints. And not to argue, but uh, Jesus 
said that there was a city that murdered the prophets. And I got an entire Bible study on Babylon. Rome didn't kill the prophets. The Lord never sent prophets to Rome. Who killed the prophets? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. That's what Jesus said. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Uh, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Uh, wait a minute. My Bible says that Pilate wanted to release Jesus. It wasn't Rome that was killing the saints in the book of Acts. It was a um, a word, a group of people who, their, their, the word of their name starts with a J. Yeah, and it rhymes with the word news, like a newspaper. Yeah. It wasn't Rome. Rome didn't kill Jesus and the apostles. No. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast, the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. There's those horns again. Uh... Those of you that had young people listening, uh, may you pause right here. I want to say an adult thing. So you might want to pause it right here. Just a warning. You know, we're talking about horns, H-O-R-N-S. Pause. All right. So why do they call it, why did it become popular usage that when a couple wanted to fornicate that they called it being horny. Well, why is that? You know, that just kind of popped in my brain. Uh, it makes you wonder, you know. All right. Adult thing over. Verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. This beast is going to rise up from the bottomless pit of hell and go into perdition. Perdition means to fall. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And everybody will say, Rome is built on seven hills. And that is absolutely true. From what I understand, so is Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, they're Muslim. And guess what other city is built on seven hills? Jerusalem. Yeah. Look it up, people. I'm, I don't make this stuff up. You know, this is what happens when the Antichrists, plural, own all the publishing houses. Uh, Vladimir Lenin said, the best way to control the opposition is to lead it ourselves. And that's what they do. They infiltrated the Vatican so that they could point to the Vatican and what do you want to bet the, the beast and the false prophet will destroy the Vatican and claim, oh, we've destroyed Esau Edom and we're the real Messiah now. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen and one is, and the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. Yeah, less than seven years, probably about 42 months. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns, and the ten horns which thou sawest are 
10 Kings. See, the Bible explains the Bible. At least the King James does. All the other versions, yeah. But you can have them. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Amen to that. And they that are with him are called. Do you know that those that are with Christ are called and chosen and faithful? Those that are with the Lamb are called, chosen, and faithful. Does that mean that Christians are the God's chosen people? I think so. Ooh, Chaplain Bob, that's replacement the theology. Replacement theology? What is replacement theology? Well, you're replacing the church. Uh, you're replacing Israel with the church. Uh... How about you read Galatians 3.29? Israel is the church. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs, according to the promise. Are Abraham's seed, not become, not spiritual seed, are. The church is Israel. They don't become Israel. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth. Remember the beast that rose up out of the sea? The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are people and multitudes and nations and tongues. Symbolism in the Bible, people. Symbolism in the Bible. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And everybody will say, Vatican City, Vatican City. Well, let me ask you a question. When the Antichrist comes and sits in the temple, is that temple going to be in Rome, Vatican City? No. Where is it going to be? It's going to be in Jerusalem, people. The great city. All right, let's go back to Daniel 8. Let's read verse 23 on, and we'll close out this chapter. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. Craft. What kind of craft? Witchcraft. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. Who's the prince of princes? Who's the king of kings and lord of lords? Take a guess. But he, the beast, but he shall be broken without hand. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told is true. Therefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. So Gabriel saying the vision, this vision is going to be, is true. Shut it up. For it shall be for many days. In other words, it's far into the future. 
And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. You know, there's a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament. A lot. So, I hope you enjoyed this study and you learned something. You know, the, the end times is going to be absolutely horrible. And your average churchgoer, they don't even think they're going to be here for any of this. They don't even know who they are. They don't know who the enemy is. They don't know who the object of Satan's wrath is going to be upon. I mean, it's they are all messed up, and they think people like me are heretics because we don't worship the Antichrist, plural. And if you don't know what the Bible definition of an Antichrist is, well, that's real simple. All you got to do is read... Uh, let me look it up real quick. First John chapter two, not the gospel of John, the book of John. First John chapter two. That's all you got to do. Read first John chapter two. And there is a group of religious people that deny that Jesus is the Christ. Yeah. And then you will know who the antichrists are so all right well all blessings praise glory and honor in jesus precious name amen